I know this, there's not a microphone, so Yvonne's got that very petite, nice voice, so I'll hopefully, uh, if somebody can't hear in the back, please raise your hand, but I uh, generally can, people can hear me pretty well. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Yvonne. I was telling her I'm fortunate enough to do two or three talks a week and workshops and things, and uh, I don't always get to see the people. Sometimes it's just a name, and which one I was saying to the ladies out there, which one's Yvonne? Which one is she? And so forth. And then I got a call from somebody at the state the other day, and anytime you deal with the state, uh, there's a little bit of paperwork involved, and so uh, they can't be doing this without talking to me. It was like, I just went, Charlie, I'm just doing this. I'm just trying to help out DSHS. So, uh, but again, thank you, Yvonne, and thank you for inviting me and for everybody for being here today. Um, let me ask by a show of hands here, how many people in this room have suffered a significant personal loss in your life? Holy cow, thank you. It's 80-90%. I am very fortunate to do anything from commencement speeches for kids. I did a talk at Bellevue College here recently, and I also go into old folks' home. And, and uh, now being an old folks myself, I guess I should come up with a better term, but it's 80, 90-year-old people. And so you get the whole range, and you can imagine the 80, 90-year-old people, 90, 95, 100% of the hands go up. And even in the schools, it's about half. So that's something that I will be talking about today, about why and how I found gratitude and how it helped me through some of these ups and downs in life. And I will tell you about my significant personal loss. It was September 29th, 1998. It was a Tuesday. I woke up and I looked over in bed to my right and I couldn't find my wife. This is strange. It was about 6.30 and I wonder where Dana is. And just then, Connor, my four-year-old son, comes in. Where's mom? I don't know. So we got to go find her. So we get out and it's strange. And so just then, Kyle, my 14-year-old, same question. We don't know. So we look in a couple of rooms and we go walking down the hallway and we look downstairs here's Dana down in front of this washer and dryer it's all crumpled over it doesn't look good and so we go running down there I turn her over there's stuff coming out of her mouth it just was looked pretty pretty bad so I said to uh, Kyle go call the police call the fire department Connor starts crying I'm trying to console him he's four as I mentioned so within a matter of 15 or 20 minutes there were probably 25 or within a matter of four or five minutes I should say it seemed 15 20 25 people in our house fire, police, medics, all that, and they took her out and they put her out in the rec room and they had these tubes and these paddles and I'd never seen anything like this before in my life. Frankly, the only thing I'd ever seen was something on TV, but it was very surrealistic. And for those of you that raised your hand, 
Yvonne mentioned that I have books and I do sell books and I sell a journal and if you want to get one great, if not you can get your own journal. It just, I just tell people how gratitude can change you. But the reason I mention it is I used to think my speaking was the best part of this deal that I get to do now. But so often it's the stories that I hear back there that people don't necessarily want to talk in front of somebody else. They say, well let me tell you what happened to me. And we can relate on how this can help you and change your life. So for those people that have been through that, you will notice one of the things that happened is that time loses all measure. And I lost complete track of time and they're just going away working on it and this little short fire person comes up to me and says, Mr. Brooke, we've been working on your wife for an hour and a half and we still won't have a heartbeat. Would you like us to continue? And even when you're in shock, this brain still manages to compute or work a little bit and I thought, 90 minutes, no heartbeat. So I said, no, you can stop. And she was dead. And she was 38 years old. And what impacted me so much was not only Dana's death, but prior to that, I had lost my mother, my father, a couple of buddies of mine in Vietnam, a couple more in a car accident the night we graduated from high school, and a bunch more, and it just went on and on and on. And at some point I thought, you know what? I've got to figure out some way to deal with this. Because when I talk to commencement speeches and kids and I talk about school or in school, I should say rather, and life is up and down. This is a lot of fun. This isn't fun. This is where everybody wants to be. But here's where the lessons are learned. And gratitude and the gratitude journal, some things I'll talk about in a few minutes, are one of the things that can help as a tool and kind of this toolkit for coping with life. Whether it's stress for jobs or whether it's traumatic things that have happened or loss in my case. But I walked up to this deck a couple days later, and I just remember, just that was 15 years ago, September 29th, 98, it seems like five minutes ago. I remember pinching myself and realizing it wasn't a dream. And I just kind of looked out at the sky. People were in our house and friends and family. They were bringing food. Everybody was doing the best they could. And I realized at that very moment, now I see why people kill themselves. It's just too much pain. We, we live by Green Lake in Seattle. I wasn't far from the Aurora Bridge. That'd be simple. You just go over there, you just jump over, it's all over. But I thought about it for five minutes and I thought, well, that's real cool, Dave. You got Kyle and Connor don't have a mother, so why don't you just leave the earth too? And they decided I'm not going to do it. And once you take a decision off the table, it's nothing you consider anymore. So I'm just not going to do it. So it isn't even up for discussion. But I realized, because of all that loss, so much of this in life is how you look at life. And one of the things people ask me all the time, and I don't know why it just makes me laugh. Do you have a PowerPoint? We don't have your slides. And I go, I, I don't use slides. Really? Well, how do you remember what to talk about? And then, I, and then these people, then the slides don't work sometimes. Um, what do I say now? You know, the slides are there. And I realize that it's how you look at something. And I want to look at every set of eyes. I get to do from 15 or 20 people, and I do a couple of churches usually a month. That's 2,500 people. I want to see as many eyes as I can and connect with people because it's all about having a tool and some tools to get ahead and get through this crazy thing called life, which can be pretty goofy at times. So I'd like you to all stand up, if you would, for a second. And I'm just going to do a quick little exercise. Oh, and in a, and in a minute, Yvonne, we can... Yvonne, we can, when we have time, we, those, that'll come in a minute. But, and I just want to pass out some cards. I'd like you to stretch out your right hand, start turning in a clockwise manner. There's a clock there, and I only say that because we're in a digital world, if anybody's confused. But this is clockwise. <laughs> There's my watch, if anybody wants to see. I see people going backwards sometimes. They go, well, I'm digital. I have, a, I have a thing. It doesn't show the hands. It just shows the numbers. I go, whatever. Anyway, so just keep it going clockwise. And then stretch. That was a nice lunch everybody had. So that feels good. And now just start bringing it down slowly, real slowly. About, keep it going clockwise to your forehead, your eyes, your chin, your chest, and now down to your waist. Now what direction is it going? Wow, a group, a group answer. Thank you. Okay, you can sit down. Counterclockwise. And there's always... And, and sir, what's your name? In the... In the in, what's your name? Ty. Ty? Yes. T-Y, cool name. There's always a few ties. This is my favorite part with it. And people, they just... And I, I've had friends of mine that have seen me speak before. They go, you know, I've seen your little talk. We're not that impressed. Fraternity brothers. And then they tell me they're not impressed, and then they go, well, so how does that work? And I go, you're an MBA. I mean, have, you've been to school. It's above and below. It's how you look at it. 
So it really, really does depend on how you look at it. And so what I talk about is one of the things I had to find is I was going to have to find some sort of coping mechanism and I'm having um, Yvonne pass out some white cards and some red cards. So I'm going to have everybody take two white cards and one red card. So as soon as we get those done, we're going to do a little something. But what I noticed about this is so many people of the 20 or 25 people that died in my life, probably half of them were their own doing. It was suicide, it was, I noticed there's a sign on the door that says prescription medication, turn them in, we've got a group deal, that's what Dana died of. She had died of a prescription pill overdose. And it was Vicodin and Oxycontin and she'd been hooked on them. And there was people that drank too much and there's all these things, it's like that's one thing if somebody gets hit by a bus, but it's another thing if they have something to do with their own life, it makes it such a different way to view it. So as I thought about this, I thought, well, there's tools out there and there's things I can do. But this embracing gratitude has started to kind of get into my life and I thought, with all this bad stuff that happened to me, how many people are going to kind of take charge of their life? So here's what I want you to do. And I'm going to, we're going to make sure, as, everybody, as soon as everybody has a white card, anybody not with a white card yet? Okay, a couple more, Yvonne. So you should have one red and two whites and we're going to take one of the whites for right now. And I will tell you right now, I'm going to have you partner up with somebody. And I always tell groups, it depends on the groups, don't get freaked out. Nobody's got to come up on stage, you know, because people just, they start losing eye contact with you and they look down like, please don't embarrass me and bring me up here and make me some example of something. But what I'm going to have you do is I want you to first of all take your white card and you're going to partner up with whoever's the next year, just find a partner. And the first thing I want you to do is right at the top is I see you as. I see you as with a little colon or whatever is a dash and write the person's name that you're going to partner up with right after I see you as and write your name at the bottom. And then I can see a lot of natural partners here. Tell me, anybody is missing a partner that we can hook up with? Okay, there. <laughs> He's left out. It's best if we have do one of you guys need a partner? Well, you gonna do a three-way deal? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose they can work. It's, probably, it's usually easier if it's just one person. And we have any any singles, just like in the chairlift, anything <laughs> that are out there? <laughs> All right. Well, we'll well actually you guys kind of can do it together because that's only I'm only gonna give you 60 seconds. So here's what I want you to do. Whether you know this person or not, I want I'm gonna give you 60 seconds and I want you to write down how you see them. I see you as friendly, I see you as outgoing, I see you as whatever. I met Yvonne and I immediately in five seconds had all sorts of feelings. Look at that smile and all that kind of thing. And I want you to each write down how you see that other person, words, sentences, whatever you want. I see you as happy, I see you as en engaging, whatever, and I'm going to give you 60 seconds and start now. Okay, about 20 seconds left. This will be interesting to see how this one works out. The three-way test over here. Okay, 10 seconds. And it doesn't have to be long, whatever you think of. Five seconds. Okay, stop. Now I'm going to give you another minute and I want you to take the card you have and read it to the person. Yvonne, I see you as and read off the list and each do that and I'll give you about a minute and a half to each read each other's cards to each other.
Okay, and stop. Did each person get to read the other person to their stuff? Okay. So I now want you to give each other your cards. Give each other the card that that person will keep. Now my suspicion is, as I said, I don't do a lot of audience participation in terms of coming up here, but if you read those things that those people wrote, it's a good example, in my opinion, of how gratitude can help you in your life. Because if somebody says, I said, what's the first thing I said to you, Yvonne, when I saw you? I said, you have this incredible smile. I said, oh, God, you're just darling. And of course she goes, it's okay, because I'm like too old to, you know, I'm not, trying, I'm not trying to hit on her. She's like 30 years younger than me, so I mean, we have to worry about that. But I've noticed as I've gotten older, I'm much more transparent and authentic. And if you say something and it's, it's just a compliment, we don't give enough compliments, in my opinion. But if you read that, just take a look and glance down at what that person wrote about you and I see you as energetic I see you as a great smile I see you as somebody who is happy I see you as somebody is that I like to work with and some people do words some people do sentences whatever but that's my illustration of how when you find something like gratitude and I'm going to talk a little bit about a gratitude journal that's how that frame your mind every single day when Yvonne was introducing me I got 400 and I think it's close to 500 now videos on YouTube and there are some presentations of things, but the vast majority are what I call my two-minute gratitude video. And later, I'm going to give away a book. And when you guys have your cards, I'll draw for a book. And if you want, I'll, I'll send you that gratitude video every Monday morning at 7.45. If you don't, I'm going to have you just put an X on your card. But people say to me, how do you keep coming up with a new idea? Seriously? Like, I've run out of things to be grateful for? And if I went and read all these cards, we don't have kind of time for it, but you'd have some common themes, so you'd have a lot of stuff that's very unique. I see you as passionate, I see you as energetic. I see you as a great worker, I see you as a good friend. When I get to do those cards, we have smaller groups and they read them. All these positive things. And when I think about gratitude, and I, I would think I'll never run out of things. In fact, somebody said, I said one day, I said, maybe I'll just be sitting at Starbucks. Where's Brooke, the gratitude guy? He's at Starbucks. He's run out of ideas. He's just staring at the ceiling over there. You know, and he's got his latte. You know, he's just done. And he's just fried. And, you know, and so, and, and, it, but it's just one of those little reminders. And so the big thing, I'm going to talk about five things today. Embrace gratitude is the first one. That's an example. How you look at it with a circle, how people see you. We don't, we so often, we don't see ourselves the way other people see us. It drives me crazy. And I don't mean to pick on women, but they, they seem to have that worse than men. I see women that are just beautiful and they think they're ugly. It just drives me crazy. And I tell them that all the time. I said, boy, you're just beautiful. Oh, gosh, I, look at this hair. And I just go, oh, gosh. I just, yeah, it's like, you're very, very attractive. I mean, it's, it's such, so neat. But if you can frame it around gratitude, that's what I start with, is, is this idea of embracing gratitude. The second thing I talk about and this is why I love to look at people's faces directly and see every single person in this room and when I can see it or get, remember the names like Ty or Yvonne or people that I get to meet, I try never to forget names because that's very powerful. But it takes as long as it takes. And when I do occasionally, when I do a big church, I'll have a PowerPoint, it'll just be a picture and I'll flash a picture of Colonel Sanders up there. And people start to giggle and somebody said, that's, yeah, that's not a good picture, you got me hungry. And I go, well, this is right after lunch. Are you okay? And I, I, pitch it, I picture it. He started KFC at 63. I am 64. I'm 64 years old. And, and I know Ty's right this very moment going, God, he didn't look a day over 63. <laughs> Thank you, Ty. He goes, dang, he would have to get my name just because I got the circle thing right. But the thing is, is that it does come down to how you look at it. And every one of us has a different journey. And I'll tell people, especially these kids in, in the schools, but I'll say, don't be looking at the kid next to you. This is your journey. I was going to be a motivational speaker when I was 19 years old, and it took me 42 years to get the courage to finally walk out of running a Nordstrom and running a Lowe's Home Improvement. And I came home on December 27th, 2011. I said to Connor, I'm going to be a motivational speaker. I'm going to talk about gratitude. Well, that's dandy, Dad. What are we going to do to eat? <laughs> And so I said, well, Connor, you just trust your dad. We bounced back from losing mom and all these things, so just it'll work. But here's Connor, and I said to him, both Connor and Kyle, you can't give up. People give up all the time. It just drives me crazy. And again, I keep referencing gratitude, and I'll talk about a gratitude in the gratitude journal and why that can help you so much in this journey, again, through this unique thing we have called life. So Connor was four when Dana died, and the people at the preschool said, your son's messed up. I said, well, his mother just died. 
yeah, 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 but he's messed up and he's got all these problems and everything. And so I was going to be to try the best dad. I, I decided I wasn't leaving the earth. I'm going to be the best father and mother I could possibly be. So I take him in for this assessment and they're bouncing balls and doing all these things and asking him questions and just this grueling six or eight hour deal. And finally, when we're done, she says, have him sit in the lobby. I want to talk to you. And he said, well, we've confirmed he is messed up. I said, thanks. I said, you know, you'll know, you know, his mom just, I, I know, we already told you that. Well, we're going to need all this special program from him and everything. And, and we, as I mentioned, I live by Green Lake in Seattle. So I said, well, my final comment was, I was a decent athlete. I said, he's going to be the quarterback at Roosevelt High School someday. And she starts laughing. <laughs> Just like this. <laughs> uh, no, 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 he's not going to be a quarterback. In fact, he's going to have a tough time in life, school, football, sports, anything he wants to play. So I go back, I get in the car, and I'm a pretty emotional person. And I just burst into tears. I couldn't stop crying. I drove home and Connor kept going, Daddy, what's wrong? And I said, it's okay, Connor. It's okay. I wasn't going to tell him. But those people must have been right because he kept struggling. I held to hold him back in first grade. I made that was a tough decision. I made that decision I thought was in his best interest. Then he wanted to play, tried all these sports, but he wanted to play baseball. So you start with coach pitch and he's five and six years old and things. And how many people here have kids? Hey, once, wow, once again, great, thank you great chunk of the audience. So you're familiar with t-ball. Now, the ball does not move. It just sits on the tee. <laughs> Connor walks in. He's swinging, he's swinging up here. Well, Connor, what are you doing? What, Dad, what do you mean? I said, y you hit the ball. Okay, so then he keeps going lower. He's finally getting near the ball and he hits the tee and the ball goes forward. He goes, Dad, I got a hit. <laughs> I go, Connor, uh, uh. But he kept trying. He just kept trying. And he just wouldn't give up. And I admired that. And the same thing with Kyle. And after Dana's loss, it would have been so easy. And you see all this stuff with murder, suicide. It's craziness out here. I got to raise these two boys. Their mother's already gone. But he kept trying. And I kept thinking, man, it, maybe they are right. Because he just couldn't get it. So we finally get to May 31st, 2005. He's about 11 years old. And he's not playing. He's usually in the dugout. He still cries every single year. And he comes out, and it's the bottom of the seventh. He's not playing. And it's like eight to seven, or seven to six, excuse me, the other team. And there's guys on second and third. It's the bottom of the seventh, and there's two out. And I think the guy was just out of players. That's, that's my guess, because guess who comes out of the dugout? Here comes Connor. He's, he's got the bat, and he's swinging it like he's Babe Ruth. You're like, he's got a big hitter, you know. And I... And, I, and then he did something that blew my mind. I'm up in the, I'm always, I went to all the practices. I was going to be the best dad in the world in light of Dana's death. And then he goes, Dad, I'm up. And I go, Connor, kids don't talk to their parents in the stands. <laughs> <laughs> you're supposed to be embarrassed that we're here. You want us to be here, but you're supposed to be embarrassed. So you don't really, you kind of see us and everything and swinging the bat again. So he gets to the plate and it's ball one, strike two, ball two, ball two, I should strike two. Full count. The next pitch comes in, he just rips it down the third baseline. It goes just inside the bag in the left field. The guy from third comes in and scores. The guy from second rounds third, and here comes the guy, here's the ball coming in from left field, the catcher. They all come together, the ball comes in, the catcher catches it, they all crash together, and the ball pops out. And they win the game, eight to seven. And he is now on second base, standing by himself, and he goes, Dad, I got a hit! <laughs> <laughs> and the entire team, the dugout was, just, again, one of these things, as I know you know when you go through these things, it seems like a few minutes ago, the entire dugout goes out to second base and puts them on their shoulders and carries them off the field. And I had such a lump in my throat, I used to not be able to tell that story without getting really emotional, and I've told it enough times now, but when we came home, and I kind of got my throat back, if you will, I sat him down on the bed, and I sat down next to him, I said, you know, Connor, now he's 11. I said, it was never about baseball. It was about you never giving up. You never, ever gave up, which is Winston Churchill. Never, ever, ever give up. And we give up so easily, and we turn to these doggone pills and all these other forms of self-medication and stuff to ease our way through this crazy thing. And to this day, I know it's a larger group, so it's going to be tougher to see, but he stuck it out. And he graduated last year from Bothell High School, and you're not going to be able to see this that well, but six foot two, three five average at Bothell High School, 
student of the year, and the leading hitter on the baseball team. Yeah, so. Thank you. And he's now, this is his graduation, he's now down in San Diego going to college, and, and it's again, for those of you parents that know, it's, it's tough. Kyle is now managing a key bank, he just left that to go work for another company, and uh, Connor's in his freshman year at San Diego. And it's tough to have, have them move on, but you want your kids to be happy and healthy, and I think possi possibly self-sufficient too, so they're, they're on their own, they're not living in the home. But it was really about not giving up, and I have a bunch of other stories, and I only have a limited time today, so I'm not going to go into other ones. But each one of you I know has stories around that, and it always inspires me when I hear these stories about people that don't want to give up. And the thing that I notice, too, is this embracing gratitude. Don't give up. It takes as long as it takes. Somebody said this to me recently. I did a video on it. He said, it's not my opportunity. So, and again, I've only got a few of the names so far, but even Yvonne and, and Ty and the, just the different people I get to meet, sometimes I can see names from here. Does that say George? Is that your name? Jeff. Jeff, as an example. It's your opportunity. And again, that's why I point to, to Colonel Sanders. It doesn't matter. I wanted to be Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates and all this kind of stuff. Well, it wasn't my plan. And you never know how you're going to get your plan. How many people have seen the Steve Jobs commencement speech? A few. It's phenomenal, connecting the dots backwards. You don't get to know now what's going to happen in the forward or in the future, but you can look now and know why stuff happened a little while ago or five years ago or what have you. So once you get this mentality, and the gratitude makes a huge difference with this about not giving up, and it takes as long as it takes. The next piece I talk about is you've got to get rid of the junk in your life. You have got to get rid of the junk, and we have a lot of it. And when you, I was trying to, it was funny, I wasn't even going to tell Yvonne, so I, I get the little GPS, because we all rely on that, and it says 111 University, it takes me down to a housing development down here, and I go, this doesn't look like the place, and I always want to get places early, I don't like to be late and stuff, and so then I go, well, wait a minute, and I look, and then it's this building, so then that says 200, my GPS thing said, or the guy from the state said 111 University, so then that's 200. Then I go there and it says, this is not the building, it's this student center over here. And so I drive over here and I'm like, gosh, I gotta figure out where the heck I'm going here. But in your car, when you go back and get in those cars, and I notice there's a lot of cars, this must be, this is probably a better chance this is the place. Notice your windshield's about two feet deep and it's about four feet wide. It's a pretty big sized piece of glass there. And then notice your rear view mirror's about this size. It's pretty small. And I haven't done the math on it, but I'm guessing that's 200 to 1 or something like that. But that's how you should have your life as your proportion. Mostly in front, a little bit from behind you. Keep an eye on that occasionally. If you see some blue lights, you may have to pull over. I understand that, you know, going too fast or whatever. But for the most part, do what's in front. Look what's in front of you and where you're going instead of where you've been. You can learn from where you've been. But when I get to do more smaller seminars where there's more kind of talking back and forth. It's not men or women, it seems to be both, but one of the biggest things they'll, they'll say, well, this is difficult for me because of my ex. And I go, you like your ex-spouse or? Yeah, yeah, it's a, you don't understand. Say, this is tough for me because of so-and-so. And I go, okay, um, I, I, when did you get divorced? Uh, 1983. And I go, <laughs> so that was like 20 or 30 years ago. And so, it's, you drive through this stuff with this windshield, people pick it up behind them, put it in front, and drive over it again. It just cracks me up. You know, get rid of it. And in order to make room for gratitude, you've got to get rid of junk because it's really, really an important aspect. When you go in, I don't know why it's maybe these cul de sacs, but I'll go into these cul de sacs and I've always taken nice care of my car, and there's these things called garages where the cars are supposed to go to be protected. But you just, you see the garage, and you've all seen them, and they go out, and from floor to ceiling are boxes. It's just from floor to ceiling, and then there's something about this big where people go through like this to, to get through to the boxes, you know. It's okay, but I always think, well, why do you have that stuff? It's just stuff. It's just stuff. It just blows my mind. So one of the things, so here's what we're going to do. So I, I talk a lot about why we want to get rid of junk in our lives. And I'm going to walk down here for a second because I want to just prove one of these points. So what's your name? Don. So Don, can you put your hand up? Which one? Either one. That's fine. So so Don, D A W N, yes. I told her to put her hand up. Now, did I say anything about pushing back? <laughs> and did I mention that at all? <laughs> but but she did. But that's Don. No, 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 no. That's 
That's everybody. What's, what's your name? <laughs> I know you don't have a name tag on. This was part of this was part of the three-way thing there where they did the I see you out. So I'm not. I'm Mike. Mike, nice to meet you, Mike. So Mike, I've got to tell you, it's not just Dawn. Everybody does that. So one of the things that I noticed about is this idea of, and there's always this one again. I love looking at faces when I talk about this stuff in the garage. Every so often, they see somebody look at me, and then the person looks next to him and I'm thinking, oh man, they probably got one of those garages with all this stuff in it. And they come back to me, why did you bring that up? Don't give me a bad time. My husband gives me enough time about all this stuff. And I go, I didn't know you were, I just used it as a metaphor, as an example. So grab the red piece of paper and we're going to do something with this. So red is, the reason it's red is a couple of reasons. I'm going to tell you one right now. When you have a red piece of paper and you write on it, it's pretty difficult to see the person next to you, what they're writing. It's pretty easy on white, but on red, it's difficult to see. And what you're about to write, you're not going to want anybody to see. And that's why, so I uh, got Don and Mike. What's Mr. Cool Looking Tie? What is it? Is it Greg? Greg? Greg. Greg. Cool. Thank you. So Don, watch Greg. Because he's, I see he's, he's, He's eased over towards your chair there, and I want to make sure. So, and now here's Mike. So, I'm going to give you folks two minutes, and here's what you're going to do. I, and this is a very, and I'm joking with Greg and Mike and Don, but uh, it's a very personal exercise, is I'm going to give you two minutes, and as best priority as you can, and the most important stuff first, I want you to write down everything in your life that's happened to you that you're pissed off that you did. Mistakes, regrets, irritations, whatever. Some people say I have no regrets, that's fine. The biggest things you just, the blunders, marrying that person, whatever it is, it, right from the biggest ones that you just are irritating, that's irritated you for a long time, or any mistakes you made, two minutes, go. About another minute. Okay, stop. Now, I, I happen to love this exercise. When I first saw this exercise, I generally one of those people that raises hands, can I have 20 minutes? You know, I, I need a little extra time. And then there's always people that look at me, well, I don't have any regrets. And I go, well, that's fine. Just count the holes in the ceiling, why the people are doing the exercise, it's fine. But to me, it's such an important thing, the same reason I mentioned the windshield and the rear view mirror and the 
the stuff that's in your brain is you have to get rid of these things. So, as I mentioned, when I was uh, gone, did uh, Greg look at all on the, and over there to the side? Okay, good, thank you. So, red, you can't see what's written on the paper. My, my timer out again. And there's another reason why I use red paper. And if we go up to a stop sign and it says green, what does that mean? And if it's red? Correct. <laughs> You're going. Nice stuff, Mr. Speaker. That's pretty basic. So, we want to stop dealing with this stuff. And that's why I said it's such a personal exercise. I want people to look at other people and all this kind of stuff. So, uh, and I, I'll try to figure out how I'm going to rate this, but uh, I'll do the best I can in a second. I'm going to give you 30 seconds because we want to stop this crap in our brain and get rid of it. And I'm going to give you 30 seconds to rip into as many pieces as you can. And whoever has the most pieces is going to get a book. Go. Ten seconds. I want to see some good ripping techniques here. Fifteen seconds. Twenty-five seconds. And stop. Okay. So what I'd like you to do is, because this is a, it depends on the size of the group I'm at, just push it out sort of in front of you and then it, at the end I'm going to kind of come over and I'll, uh, actually I can do a couple of exercises, I'll be able to walk around the room and I can see. So, um, but be careful, there's always people that have gone up and gone to the bathroom and then you see the person next to them kind of put, trying to put them together. <laughs> and so, you know, I just go, I told you this is a personal ep exercise here. So I will... Uh, yeah, I've seen some phenomenal uh, ripping techniques here. So, anyway, so but but again, I remember I did this. Um, I liked this exercise. I started it some years ago, and so originally I did a shredder, and then I have people come up as this death march and put it through the shredder, and and they don't say a word, and people are giggling. I go, don't be giggling. This is not funny. And then they put it through the shredder, and I like that. But then it actually took a long time. And so then I had a thing where we lit them on fire and then the sprinkler went on, you know, and that was because, or not the sprinkler, the smoke alarm, but I thought that was significant and smoke and flames and stuff. And then I decided there's something visceral about uh, uh, ripping it up and putting it behind you. And again, I don't, in a group this size, it depends on the size I speak to. The, there's a lot of feedback sometimes, sometimes there isn't, but it's amazing how many people will share something with each other and talk about somebody who's still bringing something up from the past. And, you know, that's why I use that rear view mirror and the windshield example so much. So, again, just kind of push those in front and I'll, um, I'll come and check them a little later. So, embrace gratitude. It takes as long as it takes. Don't ever give up. Make room for gratitude and clear out your brain. Those are my first three modules. So, I have these fraternity brothers, the same ones that said, yeah, we've seen your talk. We don't think you're that good. And uh, your little circle thing, it's, and then they, could, they couldn't figure it out, of course, but that's fraternity brothers. So I had this one friend, he said, uh, you need to get a gratitude journal. Now, how many people here have ever heard of a gratitude journal? A few, five, six, seven, well, I had never heard of one. I've heard of a journal, I've heard of a diary and things like that. And he goes, uh, as only Bob could say, he says, you're messed up. And I said, that's the same thing the counselors told Connor. And they, and, but I will say, for after Dana's death, and uh, I probably wasn't the same for four or five years. I'm a pretty high energy guy, and I talk fast. I have to slow myself down, and Mr. High Energy, and all that kind of stuff. But uh, it was tough. And I, he said, that might be a tool that can help you. So I went to Amazon, like a lot of us do, and I ordered a gratitude journal. And I got it, and I just put it on the shelf, and I didn't touch it for uh, like two or three months. And I thought, well, I was pretty stupid. I had done that before, though. So one day I'm looking at it and I think, well, maybe you ought to try this. And you ought to start writing in here. And she kind of explained a few things um, about how you write in and it's just what you're grateful for. Well, how, how's that going to work? I don't know if that's going to change me at all. But I noticed things started to change. And then it was five, six, seven minutes a day. We're not talking a lot of time. So then as I started to see the impact of that, I started thinking, well, you know, maybe you ought to do one yourself. So I did the Brooker's Daily Gratitude Journal, and there's this one, and then there's a new version I just came out with. And the saying that I have in the front, it's on the new one in the front, but it's on the second page here, is if you think about it, it's like a dream. 
if you talk about it, it inspires you. But if you write about it, it empowers you. And here you are today at this conference, and most every... Most everybody... <laughs> We're going to... We'll, we'll bring that up later. That's <laughs> Teresa. Just a second. Did you say Teresa? Teresa? Just a sec. I think, I think Teresa's calling me now. This would be great. So I started to notice this, this impact from, from writing. And I'd have people tell me all the time, and we all go through this in our life, whatever you're doing in your life, personally, professionally, people always have to make a comment on it. Well, you know, I, I, yeah, I see that, I, I've seen that writing thing. I just think about the gratitude. I go, that's fine. And I write, I've written a, a little piece down on a piece of paper. I go, that's fine. But you can record it and you keep track of this and you can see where it is and you can see why you felt one day this way or that way the other day or whatever. And my sister calls me the other day and, you know, so I, I don't use your gratitude journal. I can't really lay it flat. I went, you know, I, I said, you know, and, well, first of all, I said, I don't remember speaking on Teresa's phone. I don't remember me going, I want your opinion on my gratitude journal. I didn't, I didn't remember that, but... I didn't, I didn't want to start a fight, so I just said, okay, thank you, Gina. So, but I noticed things started to happen. And when I do the schools, as I mentioned, and, I'm, and it's such an interesting crowd. You guys are a great cow crowd, and you can kind of tell the people that really engage and kids, their attention spans are this long, you know, for those of you that either have kids or around kids, and it's tough. You have to really, I do sort of a different talk, but invariably, I talk about the gratitude journal, and there's always some kid, do you have an app? <laughs> and I go, you know, actually I do. And it's on my phone. It's the Gratitude, the Brooker's Daily Gratitude Journal app. You press it, and you press the button, and you go, I'm so grateful. To, what's your name, by the way? Your name? Mike. Mike. Did I already ask you that? No, it's another Mike. Yeah. This is like concentration with Hugh Downs. And so I was like... <laughs> And I go, I am so grateful for Mike for calling Teresa's name when her phone rang, you know, or, or whatever. And then it prints it, and it just prints it, you know, and it's like, but it's not the same. And I think what happens, like that exercise that you saw when how somebody sees you, when you start with a thought in your brain and it kind of goes to your heart and your arm and your hand, your pen or pencil, and to the paper, it's different. It's a visceral thing. And that's why so many people take notes and well, I want to pay attention to what the speaker said or this person said and they refer to it later. So it makes a big difference and I'm very, very passionate about the writing part and if a person does it on an app or whatever and on the, writes it on an app, again, I'm fine. Just, it just has such a way to change your life. And I talk about all the time, the term that I use is what I'm offering to all you fine folks is a healthy coping mechanism in a world of tons of destructive and deadly ones. And it killed my wife and, and all these things, pills and all these things. And when you can frame your life and around gratitude, it gives you such a different view. So the way I structured this is, it says here, gratitude today, that's this side, and this is gratitude tomorrow. And I've timed this, by the way, it takes five minutes. And the new one's got wider lines or you can write to uh, write bigger. But it says the day and the date, so April 23rd and so forth. And then the daily number, which I'll come back to in just a second. It says, current events and special occasions, just two lines. That's so you don't have to have a diary or journal, too. You can talk about what's going on. This is everything you're grateful for. And then down here is the highlight of your day. And typically, I write my gratitude journal in the morning because I have a tougher time sometimes in the morning with negative thoughts than I do at night. So it works better for me there. But this is the highlight of your day. So typically, that might be yesterday. If it's 1.15, it might be this morning. And then the right-hand side is gratitude tomorrow. That's what's known as your gratitude intentions. And what happens is your subconscious mind, which is located in your prefrontal cortex, cannot distinguish between what you think is going to happen and what has actually happened. So you can program. I'm always writing. I'm so grateful for the great group I got to speak to in Yakima. I'm so grateful I get to speak this weekend with Bill Gates' dad up in Vancouver at the district conference. I'm really excited about that. And he's a, gosh, Mr. Gates Sr. is like 93, 94, and I get to speak right alongside him. So I'm thrilling. So I'm thrilled. So I'm already writing how grateful I am for that and how well the talk went or what have you. So, but it really does program your brain. And I tell people all the time, whether it's, is it lay flat or whatever, I go, it's okay, just try it. 
and I get to do radio every so often, they always say, what's, our, what's your final thought for our listeners? And I go, just try a gratitude journal. Try it for a week. Try it for a day. Just see what happens, and you watch, and you can see the difference. And, and in the words of a Dr. Phil, these people that don't try it or do other things, and he always says to them, how's that working for you? And I, I, I see uh, people that are negative or depressed or whatever. But, but the daily number is something I, I really think is cool. And what the daily number is, it's right up here. Gratitude today, April 23rd, daily number, 1 to 10. 10 is the best day of your life, or one of the best days of your life, and 1 is one of your tougher days of your life. And I always like to assign that number, and I can see where I was yesterday, and I know if I'm up or down from there. I can go back and look at why was I a 9 or 10 one day, and why was I a 2 or a 3, and maybe see and spot some things that I can change or help to deal with my current situation. So here's what I want to do. So I'd like you all, and again, I just, you guys are, you guys are a great audience, because every so often you see somebody they're looking at the person. I go, don't be looking at the person next to you. I, this is just for you. I want you to think about what your number is. You three, I'm watching. I just, I want you to, I want you to just think, what's your daily number right now? One to 10. 10 is one of the best days of your life. One is really one of the toughest. Okay, so get that number, and there's no halves right now. I do halves in here, but for right now, it's just whole numbers. And so get that number, and I'm going to ask you to raise your hands in a second, but first let me say this. If you're between a 1 and a 5, I don't want you to raise your hand because I don't want anybody to be embarrassed that's having a tough day. So I'm going to start with 6. So how many people are a 6? Okay, 3, 4, 5 maybe. How many people are 7s? Wow, pretty good chunk, cool. And how many people are 8s? Another good sized chunk. And 9s? Okay, 1. And any tens? Cool. We'd be in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Danette. <laughs> Thank you, Danette. <laughs> That's good. Um, not Miss Nine, what's your name? Dusty. Dusty, cool name too. Good job, Dusty. Okay, take out the other white piece of paper if you would. And what I'd like you to do, it doesn't have a line, I might have lines on it, it doesn't matter, but first thing I want you to do is I want you to write the number one thing, if you could only pick one thing in your life you're grateful for, what is it? And again, don't be looking at the neighbor, it's not any of that, I'm not even going to give any hints, I'm just going to, whatever, if it was just one thing you could choose, what would it be? You can put the word, you can put I'm so grateful for it, whatever you want to do it, just write it down. All right, now that you have that down, if you could pick two things, what would the second thing be? Write that down. And hopefully these are in the priority order, most important and second most important. The squeaks. Okay, and last thing, one more thing. The highlight of your day. So again, it's 115, 120, what have you. If it was this morning, or you can use yesterday, today's still kind of early, you're in the conference. What was the best thing that happened to you yesterday? I'll oh, use yesterday for now. Oh, yesterday? We'll use it. You can use this this morning. Just what was the best thing? And I used to give kind of hints of things, and I don't like to do that anymore. I want you to think about it because I don't want to lead the witness here. Okay, so now, some are still writing and some have got it written down. Just review what you wrote, the thing you're the most grateful for, the thing you're second most grateful for, and what was the highlight of your day. And I want you to think about those, and now think about it in terms of how that makes you feel in this daily number again. And so now, when you've got that kind of planted in there, grateful number one, grateful number two, and the highlight of your day, how that can impact your thought patterns. I want to try these numbers again. So again, one to five, don't raise your hand. Sixes, no sixes this time. Sevens, okay, three, four, five, six, seven. Eights, Very, quite a few more. Nines, wow, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine to go along with Dusty. And any tens? Thank you, my work is done. I appreciate you all. And what's your name? I, I, that's always my favorite. I just, me? Oh, Margaret. What is it? Margaret. Margaret. So Margaret and Ty, you were both tens? Fantastic. Thank you. 
And I tell you, that is, I do that sometimes without the writing it down because the visceral aspect is so important. But just framing it, I talk a lot when I do these videos on my little video camera and I talk about if you reframe your life and refocus on everything you have versus we don't what we don't have, just that small exercise, and that took, what, maybe 30 seconds or so. So you spend four or five minutes a day on this, and you can imagine how it can impact you. And I will tell you my personal experience around this. My mother, as I mentioned, was died of cancer. I didn't say she died of cancer. She died of cancer. My dad was suicide. He got a shotgun. It's just ridiculous. And then these other friends and stuff. Well, my mother, to look up occasionally, uh, suffered from manic depression. Back then, I think it's now called the bipolar. But a lot of people that know me well and think I talk so fast and I just walk fast and Mr. High Energy and all this kind of thing, and they go, uh, I tell them, I said, I suffer from that from my mom. And I know I got the manic depressive thing from her, and I, particularly the depression part. And then my friends will go, no, you got the manic thing too, man, you're crazy. And uh, <laughs> I'm going to put up a picture of these fraternity brothers one of these days and just go, that's the guys right there. But I, I don't think that, but I just, um, in fact, it's funny because how you present yourself, how you wear your clothes and groom and hair and all that kind of thing, I always think it's interesting because people come up to me every so often, they go, you know, for a guy that's been through a lot, you actually look pretty good. <laughs> and I go, okay, so would you be, would you prefer, who's the speaker? It's the guy in the jeans over there crying. Um, <laughs> He's the guy that's had the tough time. He's going to be our speaker today. I mean, what, what are you supposed to do? I mean, you, gotta, you just have to bounce back. And that's why I talk about why this is so important. So I wake up a couple years ago, and um, I'm a two. And it's uh, very upsetting for me because I am not going to take any pills. I had my mom got into lithium and all that stuff to try to correct her stuff and then ended up dying of cancer, as I mentioned. My wife, Oxycontin, Vicodin. I just don't understand, and I just, I know pills have a very good place in this world, but I think it's just interesting. We tend to prescribe them pretty easily, but I thought, I'm not going to do it. I'm just not. It's just against what I represent, and I just can't. I don't even like, I'll take an aspirin because I'm over 50 or whatever, but you know, I, I just don't really see it. So, I knew I was really in trouble that day, and I got up, and I was a two, as I mentioned, so I thought, well, you better practice what you preach. In fact, this is actually my gratitude journal. I probably have these last about three or four months. So I have probably, I don't know, 30 of them now. And people will come up and see me and they'll look through, wow, you write in this every day. I go, have you been listening to the presentation? Or <laughs> Maybe I'm not getting my point across, but I even used Connor as I showed you as my bookmark. So I'm on April 23rd. But I knew I was in trouble, so I grabbed my gratitude journal, didn't even take a shower, just went down to Starbucks and wrote in my journal. And I never like to give you hints, but I'll tell you for me, my number one thing is health. Because without your health, it's pretty hard to have anything else. Next for me is those two doggone boys of mine. They're both now 20 and 30. They were 4 and 14, as I mentioned, when Dana died. So proud of both of them. And then it just goes on down, and I do videos, as I said, about how grateful I am for the roof. I did one up once called the furnace, because it was like 12 degrees out. And I was just grateful for my furnace, keeping it at 70. You know, and people go, you're goofy. I go, no, I'm not. I said, I'm just recognizing my furnace. You know, it's just nice. But that bounced me up to about a three or a four, maybe a five. So I was better, but I'm usually a seven, eight, nine guy. Seven's usually my worst day, and lots of there's quite a few tens. And, and um, is that Marsha? Marsha? Margaret. Margaret. It's like Mar it's like Margaret and Ty. Tens, and then a bunch of nines. Dusty was out on her own on the first, and now she's got a bunch of company at nines. It's impressive to be in the nine, ten range. I think if people had their druthers, that's where they'd want to be most days. I think I certainly would. So I was doing a talk that day, Burlington Chamber of Commerce. So I drove up, I lived in Bothell at the time when we went, that's where Connor and Kyle graduated from high school, as I mentioned. So I drive up to the talk and I'm just not in a good, I'm just not in a good frame of mind. I'm just, I just, my mom, I, I know I got it from my mom. It's very, very frustrating. So I do the talk and it was a pretty good sized group, 150 people I'd say. And when it was over, I again, as Yvonne was so sweet to point out, I have my books and things, so people come on, they talk to you, and they kind of wait in line, and this gal comes up, and she's just got tears, and she's crying and everything, and she goes, um, my name is Janice. And I go, I'm David. She goes, no, I, I, I saw your name on the flyer. 
and uh, she goes, can I give you a hug? I said, sure, and I, of course, I'm single, so you can imagine I'm always looking for an extra hug. And uh, <laughs> so she gives me a hug and she goes, and she's very emotional, she goes, you just changed my life. And I just sat there for a few seconds and I said, well, thank you, Janice. I said, I don't know if I changed your life, but I at least maybe gave you some tools and some things like this to maybe help. She goes, well, that's true. I said, well, what was it that I said? She goes, I'm not going to tell you because it's too upsetting. One of your stories that, and I do a lot of different stories depending on uh, how much time I have. And uh, she goes, but I'm going to get a journal for my son and this and that and so forth. And so I said, well, thank you. And I gave her another hug and sold some more books. And it's thrilling to me what I get to do. Managing a Nordstrom store was fun. And managing a Lowe's. And Nordstrom's good company, Lowe's. <coughs> Not so much. And uh, <coughs> I usually say it's that company that's the opposite of high. There's Home Depot and then there's other companies. There's high. <laughs> Hope nobody knows anybody works at Lowe's. But anyway. But I, uh, I walked out to my car, and I got in my car, and the first thing that hit me is, have you ever thought about who, who's your closest person in your life? And one of the ways to tell who is the first person you call with the best or worst news you have? That's one way to check. So I wanted to call Connor. Connor number one, Kyle number two. And I sat there, and I just had this smile on my face, and I went, wow. Now I was a nine and a half. And what had happened too, way back when, when my mother was depressed, she would call me and she would put her phone up to her ear and she'd shake like this and she'd go, I have a whole bottle of sleeping pills. I will take those unless you come over and see me right now. And I'd have to leave college and leave where I was working and so forth. So I know that this had impacted me greatly that I got that. And now I'm a nine and a half. And all I've done is write in a gratitude journal and change a life. And if I change one life or two, it's one more, there are two more that got changed yesterday that I got to have an impact. And so as I'm sitting there, I go, man, I'm a nine and a half and I was going to call Connor and Kyle. I thought, no, I'm just going to enjoy it myself. And I took the rear view mirror. It's always kind of embarrassing, but whatever. And I took the rear view mirror and I just looked at myself and I went, I'm so freaking proud of you. <laughs> you know, you are doing something with your life. It's either that or working at Lowe's. Where's the lumber? I don't really care. And, you know, and just. And I, I was a store manager. I mean, I'm like the mucky muck and all that kind of stuff. And it just, I just thought I get to change lives. So I tell people all the time, again, you can get mine or, or whatever. It doesn't matter, but, but give it a try. And it, it just makes such a big difference. And so when I reflect back on this, I think about something else that's changed. And, gosh, I wonder if I have that with me. No, I don't have that. So I'm not going to do the exercise today. But, but I want to talk about something else that I, I kind of toss in from time to time. And that is the ability to listen. And I haven't done it as much today, but Margaret and Ty and Dusty and Mike and Mike and Dawn and Greg. <laughs> I'm giving you a book just for that. That was phenomenal. <laughs> He's like... And I tell people, I'm not trying to impress anybody. I'm just trying to show people, if you put a little focus on something, you can do anything. And this will take you five minutes a day. It's, it's not that much time. And, uh, and I say, what, all I do is the names, as I remember. Does anybody know how to remember names, by the way? Anybody have any techniques? This, you can raise your hand on this one. Say it a couple times. Who said that, Greg? Yeah. yeah Greg. <laughs> <laughs> it's very simple. It's, um, and because people ask me, well, how do you remember that? Said, you're 64, man. You're getting older. Getting old, your memory's supposed to be shot. And I said, no, it's just it's because people like you to remember their names. And I tell them, if I can remember your name, you can spend five minutes a day to write what you're grateful for and see how much of a difference it makes in your life. But what I found is interesting is the very first thing is use their name immediately. And so, Greg, tell me, so when you were talking to Mike and Don, how did that exercise go or whatever, you use it and that plants it. But the one that seems to help even more, and then even Yvonne, where her last name is Rivera, it's not Riviera, it's Rivera. And so I noticed that when I first saw her, note something that's different, and because people love it when you remember their names. And um, my last name is B-R-O-O-K-E, 
is pronounced Brooke, and I call myself the Brooker, but people will, I'll have the same fraternity brothers, which I'm going to put up their picture one of these days, that will be sitting there and they'll go, that's my friend Dave, I've known him a long time, Dave, uh, this is Bob, Bob, this is my friend Dave Brooks. And I go, it's not Brooks, you, you've known me since 68, there's no S on the end, it's just Brooke, gosh, <laughs> man. But anyway, the second thing is, is use name association. And the key to name association, I usually don't talk about this in my talks, but I'm just throwing it in for the heck of it, is it's the first thing that comes to your mind. So Dawn said her name was Dawn. And I don't care if I'm embarrassing myself by this is how old I am or whatever, but the first thing I thought of is uh, the singing group that was Dawn, that was Tony Orlando and Dawn. And then Dusty, I thought of Dusty Springfield, which is, again, I, you know, I know I don't look this old, but I was probably in high school in those songs. But it works, and it makes a really, really big difference. So anyway, just a little, little tip there. And then uh, the other thing, too, is on the listening thing, I, I get such a kick out of it. I'm a member of Rotary, and, and I've noticed that as I get to do coaching, and I get to speak, and I get to do all these things, but I've really learned to perfect listening, and people don't listen enough. And... I would watch, for instance, at Rotary. Typically, I'd be there today because it's Wednesday at noon. And um, there'll be two of us talking. And, and the, you know, I know you guys have experienced this. And you're just talking away. And the third person comes in. You're having a nice conversation, kind of like my three-way deal over here. You know, and it's just, a, it's just a nice deal. And somebody comes up. They go, how you doing? And they say to the person, Joe, what have you been up to? And, and Joe's over here. And Joe goes, well, Sally and I just got back from Hawaii. And then this guy goes, oh, that's so funny. The last time we were at Hawaii, he goes on for like 20 minutes about his Hawaii deal. I go, we're not talking about you. And I've actually had to go, joking, hang on a second. We're not talking about you. You asked about him. And people go off on these big tangents. And it's so critical because if you listen to people and you really listen, Yvonne, you and I had a couple of conversations right on the phone, trying to really pay attention and just really listen. It's, people will think you're the best friend they've ever had. And it's so simple if you just listen. There's two guys that get on a plane in LA and they fly to New York. It's like a six hour flight. And one guy talks the entire way. And then they land in New York, they say goodbye to each other, and the guy that talked the whole way, his wife says, how was your trip? He goes, oh, I met the nicest guy. He was the greatest guy. That's how people look at it if you just listen to him. So, a little extra bonus there for you. Okay, so, Last thing I'm going to talk about is sharing gratitude. And just as a matter of review, embrace gratitude. It takes as long as it takes. Don't ever give up. It's such an individual journey. I noticed when I started getting white hair and gray hair, how did that happen? I used to have dark hair. It's just called life goes by fast. But it's your individual journey. Get rid of that crap. That's why I love that red. I got to do that before I wrap up too. And get rid of that junk in your brain. Use a gratitude journal. And then the final thing to me is sharing gratitude. Because, and I always hesitate to kind of use this as an example, but I've had a lot of people approach me about network marketing before. Gosh, Dave, you're an energetic guy. Can we have some coffee and everything? And it's not, nothing against network marketing, but they're excited about it. So they want to share it with you. You can lose weight or you can do this or whatever. So anytime or those that have a new boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever it might be, oh, I got to tell you all about him. And then, of course, three months later, I'll forget him. He's out. You know, and so it's just, it's always people get excited about things. So when you get a chance to be grateful and you get a chance to share, it makes it so much more fulfilling. So here's what I'd like to do. So... I've been talking about an hour and 10 minutes. How many times, or excuse me, how many people here, why I've been talking, have used their smartphone? One, two, three, four. Okay, so we got four honest people in the room. Uh, so it's okay. I, I did this the other day and the guy goes, uh, no, but I, I know, but can, I, can I, I wrote something down. Can I show you what it is? I wrote gratitude journal. And I just went, it's okay. That's the world we live in. So I want you to all take out your smartphones. Any phone you have. It's okay. I'm giving you complete authorization. Teresa's looking at me. Don't you give me that look. <laughs> she goes, I'm going to get my phone. Whichever phone you want. Because I talk about how important it is to share gratitude. So... I'm going to give you, I'll give you a minute, maybe 90 seconds to do this. 
And we talked earlier about what you were most grateful for in your life, and then what was the most important thing, what was second, and then what the highlight of your day is. Now what I want you to do, this is called the four T's. I have a feeling most people are going to text, but it's okay. I want you to text, tweet, telephone, or tell somebody in your life how grateful you are that they're there for you. And I'll give you 90 seconds. Text, tweet, telephone, or tell, go. About 10 seconds to go. Okay, and stop. And then, of course, you can, you're certainly free to do that more later. So, uh, Betty, good job on that. Very few people use the telephone. And uh, I would say the vast majority are texting. You can see people going like this and so forth. And then it was, I think it was a month ago, I can see it was a performing arts center, so the seats were like this. But I could hear this guy right kind of where Ty is and, and just kind of like Betty. I know, I just want to let you know how, it was a, actually, a, a, it, was a, yeah, it was a guy, but he was, I think he was talking to his wife. I just want you to know how grateful I am. I, no, I, I don't know, some speaker just said to call you and tell you. <laughs> and I just went... <laughs> <laughs> no, that's why that was so funny. It's like, what do you want, money or something? And it's like, why does it have to have a special thing to it? So anyway, all right. I got a couple more things and I'll wrap up in a few minutes. But I do want to give away a book. So do me a favor. Grab your business cards. And I will tell you, and I'm going to do a drawing. And Miss Yvonne, can you uh, do this for me? And as I said, I do send out a video every Monday morning. It's a minute and a half. If you want it, great. If not, put an X on your card when I draw your card. Because I don't want to send them out to anybody who doesn't want them. So. Greg, what's with the pattern? I like that. That's good. I was counting. I thought there was a in how many Oh, it's always hard to do. It's easier in the smaller groups. Now I have to figure out who has the most here. Cause I, so it's always kind of tough because you can see a lot of them. But it should be an even number. That's funny.
While uh, Yvonne is picking those up, I want to tell you about this book that I'm going to give away. They're, they do these things called anthology series where they get a lot of authors together. And, um, but you submit a, a story. And for those of you that have done this or anything like this, you always notice in the email there's a subject line. And so I submitted 28 straight stories and the subject line was always, thank you, but we don't like your story. You know, and then finally one day I see the subject line goes, congratulations. And my story got accepted and it was the 29th story I sent in. It is called Ready, Aim, Captivate, Put Magic in Your Message and Fortune in Your Future. And Deepak Chopra and some really cool people were in the book. So it was really kind of cool. But another one of those examples of, um, thank you, of not giving up, which is something I always talk about. And so uh, let's see who we have here today. It's got to be one of the mics, Mike Morris. Another mic. <laughs> okay, go ahead. There are a lot of mics. So if I just say Mike, I'm gonna hit something. Good job, thank you, Mike. Okay. See how many you get. <laughs> yeah, Mike. Now yeah, look. So um, as Mike is getting that book, there was a, another group I did, and you, you get to, and then I can send out my videos, and it's fun, and hopefully everybody wants them. But it's a minute and a half, and and. Um, but it's fun because you get to connect with people and they can see my little, that's the broker that gratitude guide, my video of the week and so on. But, but I always try to give away a book and try to have something that um, somebody has that they can get as a gift or whatever. So there was a one a couple months ago and it was a gal and it was a good sized group and her name was I think Sally or something and Sally Smith and yay Sally and so she comes up and I just like Mike and I give her the book and she's walking away and I said you know later if you'd like I'll sign that for you and she goes that's okay. <laughs> So I, and I don't think I'm like John Grisham or somebody. I'm just trying to make a difference here. Um, I did want to make a mention of around the work world because when I do talks at Rotary and Chambers and Rotary service above self and Chambers are more business people and you folks are all DSHL's people and working for State of Washington and so forth. And I, I wanted to make sure I mentioned this because this is really important because people will ask me, well, like Mr. Gratitude Guy and all that kind of stuff, and that's great. And Rotary, as I say, service above self, and and you know you're helping me or you're helping the kids at the schools. But what about us in the work world? And how does that how does that impact us? So how many people here? And I have no way of knowing this. How many people here manage people? Wow. Oh, so you're all managers. Okay. So I I was thinking about it one day. I think I've probably managed I don't know 10,000 people. Some of those Norwegian stores were four, five, six hundred employees, and I went and did a lot of those in Lowe's, as I mentioned. But it's so important because, and even though I'm reading this, I know this, but 20 years ago they did a survey to look for the top 10 things that people wanted as employees from their employers or managers. And the top things were appreciation and recognition, help with personal problems and be in, being in on the know. You know, the latest things and so forth. And so it's interesting, all these wages and promotions and all these work benefits and all this kind of thing was, was down the list, job security, salary, so forth. But they did it again in 2013, so last year. And appreciation and recognition is still there. You know, who would not like it? Mike, you're doing a great job. Congratulations on getting the book. You know, or any of those things to be called out. And I always learned as I was managing those big stores, praise in public. We didn't, at Norris, we didn't even use criticize. It was, it was strengths and opportunities. But if you have an opportunity, let's do that in private. I'm not going to do it in front of anybody else. And Don, when you have a second, we'll talk later. I mean, whatever. It's just you don't do it in front of people, right? So, but now, the top three, number three was responsibilities. Number two is goals. And this is the one that really, I really paid attention to is purpose. So many people now want a purpose. And for those of you that I didn't realize you all manage people, I think, and a lot of you raised your hands, I think the majority that have kids, I think managing people and raising kids is pretty similar in this sense. The common thread to me, which always worked, and I'm very proud of Kyle and Connor, and got a lot of awards as Mr. Store Manager, and even through all the tragedies I went through, is you gotta set a good example. And if you set a good example and you're grateful for yourself and for your health and for your job and your spouse or your kids, and then you're grateful for your employees rather than I watch people treat them like crud. And, and to me, it was always important to use the golden rule. And I think even at Nordstrom, 
I never started a sentence, or Lowe's for that matter, you know, can you do me a favor and, and just when you get a second, do these chairs. And we've all worked with people that aren't like that. And they wonder why you're succeeding and they're not. So the whole gratitude piece really, really works well. And in the metrics I've been able to follow up with companies I've been into to speak to is that it's, you know, higher retention rates, lower turnover, increased engagement, decreased absenteeism and things like that. So it really is something that makes a big difference. So that's why I'm such a fan of, I call this, this gratitude leadership workshop. So the last thing I'm going to finish up with is this idea of sharing gratitude and just one more reminder, this embracing gratitude and it takes as long as it takes. I just cannot tell you how much, how strongly I feel about that because I wanted to be all Mr. Rich and Famous when I was younger and that wasn't my path. This is my opportunity to do what I get to do now and change lives and it's just absolutely thrilling to me if I made a difference with one person today that was one more than yesterday. And then this idea of getting rid of the junk in your brain. So I love the red paper exercise so much. And um, get a gratitude journal, mine or whatever, but it's so, and you'll see an amazing difference in your life. And then lastly, uh, sharing gratitude. And when I think about sharing gratitude and they get to give away a book and meet all these neat people and you just want to go out and you, that's why that texting exercise to me is so much fun and and uh, I love to hear some of the conversations like with Betty and oh, she looks like she popped out and just you can hear people or what do you want or how much money do you need it cracks me up you know I'm just telling you I'm just grateful for you I don't need anything special but what is interesting is that for me I think of an example that I had where I never did the drugs, I never smoked dope, I never smoked cigarettes, I just didn't get all that stuff. I feel very fortunate I didn't go down any of those roads. But I was always an adrenaline guy. So I was flying, I learned how to fly when I was young and had an airplane for a while and got crazy and over leveraged in property and a bunch of stupid stuff. And, and I, but I jumped out of airplanes and scuba dived and all these different things and bungee jumped and it just was, I don't, I don't particularly care for heights which is always strange but I just don't like things to defeat me. So. I remember once I got those same, I'm going to get a picture of them, those same fraternity brothers. Everybody wants to skydive. So I make an appointment for eight people, you know, and they're all, all we're going to do it, Dave. You're the ringleader. So I make the appointment. It was back at Issaquah for a Saturday. And so then on Monday, I, I call them all, you know, we're going Saturday. And then on Tuesday, like two of them couldn't make it all of a sudden. And then on Wednesday, I got another call. Yeah, I think uh, we're having spare ribs at my mom's house, so um, <laughs> I'm really not sure. And then by Thursday, uh, Dave, uh, <coughs> I think I have a sore throat. And I, so you're not going Saturday? I, I really wanted to, but I, I got a sore throat. It's probably like, so I walk into Issaquah skydiving at 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning, walk proudly up to the counter. I go, Can I help you? Uh, Brooke, party of eight. <laughs> and he looks at me and he looks, where are your friends? And I go, I don't have any. And I went by myself. And I actually have a picture of it. You know, and, and like, anybody skydive here? Anybody done it? Yeah, so you know, static, free fall, so you guys know. And, and I did, later did the free fall, but the static, I'm like, all oh, the little thing, you jump out of the plane, I'm all like afraid I'm going to die and stuff, you know. But I didn't get to share it with anybody. And so it always really bothered me. And I really realized that so many things in your life, when you get something, so if you're fortunate enough to get the gratitude piece and see how it can change your life, and when you share it, one of the things I've learned, I've been through so much tragedy, as I mentioned, but one of the things I figured out a long time ago is if you want to help yourself, help other people. And it just seems to work over and over again. It's not why you do it, it just seems to work. And I will offer to you that if you give gratitude a uh, try, especially the gratitude journal, but really, really understand it, it's this really, really healthy coping mechanism in this world of all these deadly destructive ones, as I mentioned. And I feel it can change and transform a life. And in my case, I truly feel it saved my life. And it can save and change yours as well. Thanks a lot, you guys. Thank you.